everyone, and welcome to the All It Takes a Goal podcast, the best place in the entire world, including all of Canada, to learn how to build new thoughts, new actions, and new results. I'm your host, John Acuff, and today I'm joined by Becca Stevens. Who's Becca Stevens? I'm so glad you asked. Becca Stevens is a speaker, a justice entrepreneur, an author, a priest, and the founder and president of Thistle Farms. She's been featured on PBS NewsHour, The Today Show, CNN, ABC, World News. She was named a CNN hero and White House champion of change. She holds five honorary doctorates and raised over $65 million in funding. Drawn from 25 years of leadership and mission-driven work, Becca leads important conversations across the country with an inspiring message that love is the strongest force for change in the world. And she's my friend. I love Thistle Farms. Thistle Farms is based in Nashville. We started working with them years and years and years ago. She is a baller. Amazing, amazing person. I can't wait for you to meet her. Every year we do this big candle drive at the end of the year called 500lightshome.com. We're going to talk a little about that, but how do you run a nonprofit for 20 years, which is 5,000 years in nonprofit terms? How do you have a product that's so good that it gets picked up by Whole Foods? We're going to go all over in this conversation. But first, a quick message about the sponsor of today's episode. Every year, I set crazy big goals, and every year, there's one productivity tool that I use to help me reach them, the Finish Calendar. I've been using it for over a decade, and it's helped me crush goals like running a thousand miles in a year, growing my business, and writing a New York Times bestselling book. Thousands of people have bought them over the years too. Why? Because it works. It's not magic, it's science. Study after study has shown how important tracking your year is. But my favorite came from the University of Kostanz in Germany. They showed that when you track when and where you're going to work on something, you double your chances of success. Let me say that again. You double your chances of success. This calendar is massive. It's beautiful, it's motivational, and it comes in paper or dry erase. On top of all the other amazing features, you can choose to display it vertically or horizontally because this bad boy is also double-sided. If you've got a big goal or a lot of big goals, Grab a Finnish calendar today at finishcalendar.com. Once again, that's finishcalendar.com. All right, let's jump into my interview with Becca Stevens. Becca, so glad you're here. We were already joking and laughing before we even turned on the microphone, which is like the first rule of podcasting. You're never supposed to do stuff like before you get into the space. So, but I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for joining me. I am so happy to be here. You're one of my all-time favorite people to get to sit in a room with or be on Zoom with or welcome at Thistle Farms. It's just an honor. Yeah, it's been super fun to hang out with you over the years. We've done a ton of things together. So for people who haven't heard of Thistle Farms, how did you start Thistle Farms? Why did you start Thistle Farms? What is Thistle Farms? Give us the snapshot of what it is you guys do. Sure. So, you know, like many, many people, I have some deep roots into what trauma looks like and feels like. My dad had been killed when I was young by a drunk driver. There was some ensuing um, abuse by a friend of the family. And so early on, I think it wasn't hard for me to have compassion for people who I met on the streets or, you know, when I was doing my work. So I started out as an Episcopal priest ordained about 30 years ago. And I'd had just a real strong um, desire to work with women who needed some compassion and love. And so I started by housing women for two years free with no authority in a house. And, you know, this was 25 years ago. And it was like, maybe just open one house, help a few women and see what happens. The women I got to work with were so powerful that we kept opening houses. And then we realized that if we are going to be about love and mission, that we had to worry about people's economic well-being. So we started the whole enterprise called Thistle Farms. And from there, it just grew into a national organization. And eventually, now I would say it's a global movement for women's freedom. We have 30 partners around the world you know, 600 beds around the U.S. We have make millions of products 
in dollars, products a year. We have a cafe, lots of fun stuff. It's an interesting intro because you said a lot of very challenging things in a very short way. So like we just decided to house women for two years for free because like, how do you, you have this idea? Cause there's a lot of people that are listening to this right now that will say, I want to change the world in a small way, a big way, medium way, whatever. How do you go from, wow, I've had my own trauma. I would love to help people process, heal from that in their own way too. So how do you go from that to we're going to house people for two years? So that's a great question. And for me, what it is, is very simple. It's like sometimes you think, okay, if I just have one house for five women, I mean, that is a doable goal for somebody that wants to gather community, raise money, set priorities and, you know, attach it to another not for profit or whatever. And it, but the problem is I think for a lot of people is they go like, what's the difference does it make in a world? I mean, to help five women, when you're talking about women who are survivors of trafficking, addiction, who have been prostituted, commercially exploited, how could helping five women make a difference in that world that's a huge scale, you know, these universal issues? Mm-hmm. It's crazy to think it could help. And what I realized early on and what I would say to anybody listening is what's crazy is to think if you don't do something small, anything will ever change. So let's make a difference <laughs> by doing something small, which is doable. It's a doable goal, but doing something small with great love, I think has the biggest impact. So in some ways that return on that investment has been huge. You know what I mean? It's like, it's affected thousands and thousands and thousands of women because it's not like you tried to have this huge impact in a short amount of time. You decided to do something small over a long period of time. And that has a huge impact. Yeah. So you said doing something small with great love has a big impact. I think that's an amazing, amazing statement because if you do the math, so five, five women, five beds to start, you know, it's 600 beds. That's a hundred times. That's 120 times like scale, but that's not even counting all the women that have gone through those 600 beds over the two year program. So you there, there's inflection points to your story where you try it and then you realize, OK, economically, we need to help them. But that's not what you were. You didn't set out to be, you know, a small business starter or a nonprofit that had an economic backbone to it. When you come up to the ledge of doing something completely different than you know how to do, like very few people would go, oh, Episcopal priest. I bet one of the steps is you run a global enterprise that has products in Whole Foods. Like though the line between those two things is very curvy. So when you stepped up and continue to, because I, I get to watch and be part of the Thistle Farm story as somebody who lives in Nashville, when you step up to big, like, whoa, are, are you wired that way to take that risk? Are you... You've learned that there's value there. Like, how do you face a big gap between where you are today and where you want to be tomorrow? Um, So here's what one of my favorite quotes is a couple, I guess it was a couple years ago. Forbes magazine did a story and said, Thistle Farms is successful because we're a mission with a business, not a business with a mission. So the business evolved out of that mission. It wasn't like I was on a ledge. It was like, it was just a path. And honestly, the idea of bringing love into the marketplace is appealing to me. It doesn't feel like a ledge, like I'm scared. It feels like I want to engage the world. I want to share the stories of Thistle Farms. Products are a great tool to do that, but it's, it's just a tool. So, you know, it's really about saying, you know, we know now women heal for lifetimes. Like they come off the streets, they don't have to go back. They are the heroes of their story. They change communities and heal communities and help their families. And so if the products are a vehicle for that, it's like, yeah, I'll do that. I'm in. I'm in for that. And so I have loved it. And and making things is not scary either. It's very fun. It's fun to blend essential oils into things and see how they yeah. um God, you know, just seeing how it works. And the other thing is that sometimes I think when we think, any of us think, oh my gosh, I have to do this and it's going to be a success or failure. 
based on me. It's too much. You know, a whole community did this. I did this with a ton of other people. And it's like I have trusted my whole life in some Pollyannic, amazing way that people want to hope with you and people want to be in love with Mm -hmm. you and the things that you do, that there is a kindness of strangers, that there is hope in community, even though we see only certain reflections of that coming through our phones. (laughs) But like the fact that like Mm -hmm. for years, you know, John, you show up and you help us sell a ton of candles at the holidays. And you, that is amazing. And you're one of several people who don't forget us. And we know that we're going to be okay. It's like, it's so fun. It's not a ledge. It's like more like a party. It's like, how do you get to the party? Yeah. Well, yeah. You get to the party by saying, I'm going to try these new things with a group of people and see what the market will bear. I love that because it is like a party when, so we do this thing, 500lightshome.com, where we try to sell 500 candles every Christmas. The URL is right now. You guys should buy a candle. Anybody listening to this, it's an amazing gift. We'll talk some more about that. But I'll go to Thistle Farms and we'll film a video to promote it. And we spend the entire time laughing. And like the first thing is I get to see all these old friends that I've had for years that are in the cafe or they're running different parts of the warehouse. And they're like, what? And then I get to meet new friends that'll go, oh, I'm a year through. Like I but we've heard about the candle thing. Like, so I'm so excited. And you'll go, this is, you know, so and so she's super sparkly. We want to put her on camera because she's a natural. <laughs> and then we'll, you know, then we'll and I'll, I'll I remember the last time I did it. I did in the video, I was like, oh, I'm geeking out about this. And they and somebody stopped me. He's like, hey, don't say geeking out. That's a drug term that we don't say geeking <laughs> out. I was like, oh, okay, like I didn't know. And we all started laughing about that. And so it does feel like a party. I love that sense of you find something you're deeply passionate about and you start a party and you trust that other people who will catch the vision of the party are going to show up, show up too. Now you get to share stories um of the women all over the world um, as somebody who speaks and writes, what's a story that if somebody said, okay, Becca, I can tell you're doing some amazing work, but like, what's a specific story you'd go, Oh, here's this, here's a story that typifies the kind of stuff we get to do. Like I got to see so-and-so reunited with their kids, or I saw somebody who'd spent 10 years on the street, spend the next five years off them. And she now runs our warehouse. What's a story that lights you up? I will definitely tell you that. But I also want to say some of those expressions that we don't know kind of where they come from or what those meanings are and how they impact people are so interesting because it's this idea that, oh, okay, I can hear that now through your ears and I'm willing to say it differently. Not everybody's willing to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a hard thing to do. So I admire you for even remembering that. But somebody just, this was, I guess it was, it was this past week I was talking to a group and they were saying that the idea that we offer this free to women as a gift. And the idea for me has always been the reason the housing has to be free is because everything's been monetized in the women's life. Every relationship oh. monetized. So the idea of saying, can we give in gratitude for the mercy we've known? Can we give in gratitude for the mercy we've known and offer this gift? And then women can choose to do whatever they want to with the gift. You know, they're, we aren't the hero. We're just the host for the story. And I was telling that in this group. And the woman said, well, I think the women need to put some skin in the game. Yeah. And I said, do you realize that they've sold their skin, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, there's nobody that got more skin in the game than people who have been sexually trafficked in the world and maybe they don't need skin in the game anymore maybe that we need to say you know we're going to do this and you don't have to put skin in the game ever again not that you're not going to give not that you're not going to yeah. pay taxes not that you're not going to be responsible but this part is a gift this part that you will understand what recovery and love looks like in your life has to be a gift and you still do the key ceremony? Wasn't there? T- yeah. Was there a time where like for some of the women, it was the first time they, can you, can you explain that a little bit? Well, I will say this, that the sad thing for me is technology. <laughs> so there's no more keys. Now everybody has a code to get in the house. Ah, okay. Okay. Cause it used to be, house- that was the first key in the lock that was safety for them. 
Yes. And now there's no more um, handing over the key. You know, now everybody gets a code. So yes, in essence, it's a key ceremony, but there is no longer a key. <laughs> they get an email. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> These women get an email that says, hey, congratulations. You're no longer homeless. Here's your email. Yes, it's exactly. It's basically <laughs> that intimate. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to tell you yeah. a story that happened a couple of weeks ago that I think is my favorite right now. And because I have a million stories. And here's the thing is that I've learned as much in the failures as in the successes. So I could tell you a story about something that didn't go so well and just how beautiful it was to still see um, community and compassion at work. But I want to say that just a couple few weeks ago, I got a text from one of the graduates who, like many of the women, she, um, her story started so young with so much trauma, including a car crash that killed her sister, but she survived when she was like eight or nine. She ended up, you know, very addicted, very abused, so much so that she had heart, open heart surgery at like 21 years old. And, um, you know, didn't think she deserved anything in this world. She came to Thistle Farms. She um, began to be the, one of the candle makers. She actually was the leader of the candle team for a while. You probably know who this woman is. And um, she graduated. She got an apartment. And then she did what people do who graduate and get apartments is that she went and got a puppy. But her puppy was like an accessory. It's a teacup chihuahua named Coco. And she went and got mm -hmm. a photo shoot with she and Coco. So she texted me this picture. And underneath it, it says, I love Coco. And I was like, that's amazing. I mean, it's a full on, full on photo shoot puppy, just beautiful. She's shining and beautiful. So I just texted her back and just asked, what do you love about Coco? And then she texted me back. He protects me. And I was laughing, you know, when I first read it, thinking, well, you got the wrong breed, a teacup chihuahua. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah. this is what she's wanted her whole life. This dog is protecting her from the worst stuff in the world, thinking maybe she can't be a caretaker or love or maybe she's going to be cynical and bitter. or Maybe she's, you know, um, afraid she's going to just be alone in her recovery. And this dog is about love and companionship. And it is protecting her from all the dangers in this world. And I was just like, I think we all need to find our cocoa in this kind of world we live in with so much polarizing politics and uncertain economics and destabilizing war. Like we need a cocoa sometimes. I bet I do. I think I'm sure I know exactly who you're talking about. I, I love that the, by going there multiple times, you get to be friends. And I entered Thistle Farms via our mutual friend, uh, Al Andrews, who is one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, yes. He introduced me. And one of the first things I did was sit in the circle and walk people through what the circle experience is like. Absolutely. So one of the things about for anybody, ex ex again, who's running a business or is part of a business is the idea of being a really trauma informed place is means that you're a place with compassion and oh, some whatever you call it, programs built in to support and nurture your teams, which is critical. And it's especially critical at Thistle Farms. So we start out um, every Wednesday gathering in a circle, the whole community. So again, it's not necessarily optimal financially, but it's what you do so that you can keep being a healthy organization. So everybody gathers and we just light a candle in the middle and we say, we light this candle for the woman on the street and the woman trying to find her way home. Then um, we read one of our practices. So we have practices like, you know, take the longer path, um, laugh at yourself, consider the thistle, all kinds of things we do. And people write pieces on those reflections. And we just go around the room and everybody does a check-in and reflects on how they're doing and what the community could be doing to support them. Yeah, for me, it was interesting to hear volunteers mixed into that because it's a really, it's a really powerful experience to invite other people into. Because I think most people that aren't at Thistle Farms don't have a room where they get to do that. And it made me go, oh, this is a real miss for normal, quote unquote, normal life where 
Because I, I remember one cold, it was a cold January and somebody said, I light the candle today for the woman who's still on the street because I remembered on cold days like this, I do anything to get inside a car for a few minutes. And that was like, and you're sitting next to somebody who maybe plays tennis usually on that time of day and is going, wait a second, it's a volunteer. It just created this really interesting conversation across economic lines, across faith lines, across, you know, experiences and, 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 you know, ages. And so I thought, I thought it was really interesting. How else have you guys invited people into the Thistle Farm story? If anybody's in Nashville or coming through Nashville, we're located at 5122 Charlotte Avenue, and that's every Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. In addition to that, we have a cafe right at our uh, manufacturing place right on Charlotte Avenue. And the cafe is amazing. I think whatever we do, we try to do it in this way that's both lavish and economical and make it the highest quality so people want to engage it and want to see the love and beauty that's in a product, that's in the food, that's in the circle, whatever it is. So we, people are welcome. I mean, we have, I promise, John, we have women who have come from California to drink a cup of tea in our cafe and sit in that circle. I love lavish and economical. Yes. I mean, and people that think- is so like, good. Well, people that is so good. You're doing justice work that you have to do it on the cheap and it's not the way to do it. And we can show that in- like a million dollar home, you can house eight women for two years. We've built two of them now. And we can do it for half the cost of what it costs to keep women in prison. At the end of the two years, women are paying taxes. They're, um, they have their children back. They are contributing and buying things in the community. They're safer in the community safer versus, you know, keeping women who have were victims long before they were criminals locked up. And at the end of that same period, they're at more risk. And so is the community. So it's lavish and economical go hand in hand. I love that. How many women right now, and maybe you don't know the specific number, how many people are on the waiting list? Because I know that's that's the challenge. And one of the reasons we we do the 500 lights home.com is we're like, hey, the more we support and give the the more houses you get to build, the more space there is. Are there women on the waiting list right now? So the crazy thing is, is that Sheila, who is the director of our residential services in the national network, she's also a graduate of the program who went back and got her master's degree in social work and runs all this, is right now. Of course. Wait, let's not run. Let's not run by that. Like, that's another one of those Becca Stevens sentences where you're like a lady who went through the program and then went and got her master. Like, that's amazing. That's an amazing story right there. Okay, go on. Sorry, cut you off. It's just so fun. Well, there's more than 600 women on her list. So right now she has a list of 600 women that are trying to get into a house. Right, which is part of the reason we are desperate for investment in the national network so we can continue to open more and more programs. Because, you know, a lot of times it's about referral and making sure a woman's safe. She doesn't need to stay in the same community. So we are working super, super hard to continue to build out the national network. I mean, today I was in a group. I was teaching at Thistle Farms this morning, and there was, I think, eight or nine different cities who are trying to open programs, and we're just... We're just doing everything we can to help nurture those programs because, I mean, I mean, John, there's women dying to get in places. And it's not a Nashville issue. It's a it's a whole world issue. Yes. So somebody listening to this is going to send write a ten thousand dollar check like somebody listening to this is going to go, oh, my gosh, I didn't know Thistle Farms existed. Maybe they'll buy a thousand candles at 500 lights home dot com. Maybe they'll just write you guys a check. Either way. Awesome. What would you do with that money? Like if Thistle Farm, like as a, as somebody who would go, oh man, we here's the thing, here's the immediate needs I think about. It's easy for me. Like one of the things that we are really, really trying to do right now is renovate two different houses. I would put the money into right now to renovating. We have several houses that are beautiful and great, but there's a couple that really, um, you know, need to start renovation. And if we could start working towards that for really so... Women are finding safe sanctuary that is a great place to land long enough to get your mental health right, to get your teeth right, to start job training, to do all of that. You need a safe place. And that's what I would put the money towards immediately. That's the first place. I want to switch gears for a second because this question, I've thought about this before and I've never asked you. 
I think one of the first events I went to at Fourth Thistle Farms, because you guys put on events in the Nashville area, I want to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say it was at the Ryman. I think yes. John, Pr- John Prine was there. Am I wrong about that? No, you're right. And Jason Isbell. John Prine played with Jason Isbell. Reba McIntyre yep. was there. It was unbelievable. What's it been like for you to have the music community come out and support? Because that's what's been really fun. Like another event, my, wa- my wife went to this one. I believe it was Bre- Brene-, Brene Brown was there. So you've had a lot of support from a lot of people. What's that been like for Thistle Farms to have people like that come alongside? Well, I don't know if you, I've been married to a singer songwriter for 35 years he um, he's in the Songwriting Hall of Fame, Marcus Hummond. He's written songs like Bless the Broken Road, Cowboy Take Me Away. He is in that world oh. in beautiful ways. I mean, he's amazing. And when he has come alongside Thistle Farms the entire time. So music and Thistle Farms have always gone together, <laughs> you know, in a real organic, natural way. And so we've had events where we've had other very famous singer-songwriters just sit with women and listen to stories and then collaborate to write songs. And I mean, some of the biggest names in Nashville have, have done that journey with us years ago, but I love whenever we can really share the story of hope and share it in a way that's healing for women that have gone through, but also healing for the wider community that says, Oh my gosh, we can intervene. It's not endlessly somebody on the street corner looking for a dollar. This is actually an investment that then changes lives forever. And sharing that through story, through song, through witness, through candles, sharing it anyway, you know, I love it. So those events are super fun, but you know, I just think artists need to feel hope too. They're lucky to get to be on the stage with the women. <laughs> oh, that's so good. They're lucky. Yeah, they're lucky to get to be on the stage with the women too, because you're right. They're the they're the stars up there. It's interesting. So you've done something that from the outside, my perspective, I'd go, wow, it's really nonprofits are challenging. They they just are. Non nonprofits are challenging. So there's there's two questions I have. One, how do you hold the weight of the stories you're exposed to? So a lot of the story, like it's these, this is heavy. So if I'm somebody and there's, I've got a real passion for something I want to do, but there's a heaviness to it. How have you stayed light throughout the years, even as you deal with dark stories and heavy work? You know, I think early on for whatever reason, you know how like people like really struggle, like, especially if they have had abuse and trauma in their life and they're like, how did God let this happen? And da, 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 da. I never had that. I don't know why, but I always had this feeling that God was love and was right with me on that journey. And I kind of feel like that in my work. Like I don't cry for people. Like I weep with people and think, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm here and walking beside you, but it's not, it's not a heavy burden that love has us and we're going to get through it. However it shakes out, shakes out. And so it doesn't feel that heavy to me. And the stories are tragic, but there's also amazing, heroic, fun stories too. I mean, honestly, the experience you have when you come over to Thistle Farms doesn't feel heavy. Like when you were saying we're laughing and we're being with people. There are heavy moments for sure, just like in all our families and all our lives. But there's so much joy. And I would say, again, to anybody listening, is you don't have to cry for people, but if you're willing with this empathy to just weep with people just for a little bit, then then they're also going to be willing to laugh with you. And, you know, again, it's a whole community of people doing a whole lot of good stuff, and I'm just a small part of it. Yeah, and that's the word that I keep coming back to is that sense of laughter because it's always so fun when I go there uh, it's always fun to film videos with you guys. Um, I just, I, I love it. I, I think it's a, it's an amazing, amazing experience. I'm curious for you. So as you continue to do new things, so I, I, I read your bio and there were some amazing things on it. There's CNN and you know, the today show and all these things. 
do you ever feel imposter syndrome? Do you ever, do you just walk into it? Like what's your approach to your, you know, as you're one person of a community, but you are one of the visual people in the community. Do you ever feel imposter syndrome or do you just kind of walk into it and go, well, this is the stage that I've been asked to be on today and I'm going to be fully Becca because that's the only thing I have access to. So let's go. You know, sometimes I feel embarrassed because I'm getting so wrinkly. I don't know if that makes any sense to you as a dude. <laughs> but, no, for like, me, it looks like wisdom. <laughs> Unfortunately, as a dude, it just looks like wisdom. They go, man, he's really oh good God. at taxes. That's what they say. But sometimes I like that's what I think. I think like, oh, my gosh, maybe if this was 20 years ago, I'd feel more comfortable with it. Yeah. But I kind of just try to not to be self-conscious and just go for it and say, I believe in the message and I believe it's a big idea to talk about how love heals in the marketplace and in a world that is so hungry for it. And I want to I want to contribute to that conversation. So I just try to step into it. You just you just lean into it. So some of the yeah. moments you talked about with laughter, what are some of the like the graduation ceremony or you finish the two years? What's that like for the women? Oh, my gosh. So my favorite thing that happened was during the pandemic, we didn't know how we were going to do a graduation because you couldn't get people together. And graduation means that somebody has completed the two year residential piece of the program. It doesn't mean they're done working at Thistle Farms or maybe they're moving into management, but they're generally moving into their own housing. They have cars. They're getting their children back. It's a huge accomplishment. There's a lot of work that goes into those two years. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to do the event. And it was finally we decided that behind Thistle Farms, there's an alley. There's an alley. So um, Thistle Farms is on Charlotte Avenue Cafe, all the um, offices, some manufacturing, huge parking lot. And there's an alley that runs in the middle of it. And we decided to call friends who had um, convertibles and invite the women to each would have a convertible. And we do a parade down the alley. So it was outdoors. Everybody could be separated. It was amazing. <laughs> the women, I mean, there was probably a hundred posters that people made and balloons and that women have flowers and they're sitting up in the um, convertibles and everybody's screaming and waving and there was music blaring at the end. And then at the end of the alley, they came out into this big parking lot where we celebrated them. But it's always this just it's a lot of people's favorite day at Thistle Farms, like community coming together. They come and celebrate because it's such a joyful event. And the thing that I think is the best is when you see um, families reconciled come to these events, families that were maybe part of the abuse or families who have been burned by all the addictions that are in the wake of so much trauma. But you see them coming together and people cheering and hugging and just in love. It's beautiful. I I love that. I love that you guys figured out a a creative way to do it. Walk us through, walk (laughs) us through the space. So because some people will be able to visit, some won't Um, walk us through the Thistle Farm space, because I've seen it grow over the years. I remember when I first started coming there and we do candle pours. Who is not coming? Who's not coming? (laughs) Yeah. When you said some people aren't coming, I would like to know their names. (laughs) One of them is it's Matt. I know there's a Matt right now. that's like not. I don't know what his issue is. Um, He might have already stopped listening to this episode and is like, I want to do I want to know more about how to do more push ups. This is too this is too deep. No, but what I remember the first one of the first times we did a candle event there with you guys. One, we knocked it out in an hour and I think we had planned four because we had so many people from my community. We had like 95 people show up, which was amazing. And we are all like, OK, I guess that it was so fast. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And so the space looks like if you come to Charlotte, it's none of the residential places. Those are all um, scattered around the Nashville area and, of course, in other cities and stuff. But if you came to 5122 Charlotte Avenue, you would see a store. There's a retail store right in the front. And to the right of that store, there's all the offices. And that's everything from, you know, accounting to development, fundraising, um, inventory, whatever. All of that's over in the offices. To the left is a cafe. And the cafe is stunning. It's beautiful. It has a whole um, 
it's like a chandelier sculpture of teacups. And the idea is a teacup in every story. And it hangs like a wave overhead with lights coming through it. And beautiful old pine, like, um, oh, what is it called when you have like a... Reclaimed? Anyway, or... booths, like booths. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, reclaimed wood that's all into, but it's made into booths. And actually the wood comes from Al Gore Sr.'s old tobacco barn. That's how old it is. And then you would walk out to a back porch and there's more seating there. And then it walk, you would walk down some steps. You'd see an herb garden on the right and there's a bigger garden further down the alley. And then if you cross the alley, you would see this space. And it's no longer the manufacturing space. It's the space for global products and global teams a marketing team, HR, and then we have now a workout facility for all the women at Thistle Farms. Plus, we have rented out space to um, the Center for Contemplative Justice and Larkspur, two other great not-for-profits. If you drove down the road, the new manufacturing space on Cockrell Bend is about twice as big so we can keep producing what everybody wants. That's what's there. How many candles a year do you guys make, roughly? Or specifically, actually, I want to know the exact number, like tw- either way, specifically or roughly. How many candles a year do you guys make? 54,000. That's a ton of candles. What was it like to get the candle in Whole Foods? Because I always I always talk about how because sometimes sometimes when you hear nonprofit or the joke I'll do is like sometimes if somebody has an ichthus and they're a plumber and it's a, there's an ichthus on their business card, it means they're a bad plumber, but they're going to pray for you. And like, I think growing up, if I ever saw that, I'd be like, I just need you to be an amazing plumber. Like, I need you to crush it on the plumbing part. Um, Sometimes nonprofit, you know, whether it's they're not being lavish, they're not there's a there's a lack of excellence to it that develops. But you guys are really, really smart about that. What was it like to get your product in Whole Foods? Because I know Whole Foods is so specific, so complicated to get in. Was that, you know, what was that moment like for you guys as an organization? Well, when we first got into Whole Foods, in all honesty, um, Thistle Farms was still pretty small. When we were making products on Mondays and Wednesdays, we only were making products two days a week. And I promise you, we were only in two Whole Foods stores. I would drive to Whole Foods on Tuesdays and Thursdays and buy candles. (laughs) I was so scared that things you would buy them because you. Yes, I wanted to create a demand. (laughs) That's so good. How many candles would you buy on Tuesdays and Thursdays? Oh, I mean, just a few. But I would go every time to make sure we were moving candles off the shelves. Like I didn't want them to sit on the shelves. I knew if we were going to develop this relationship, we were going to need to be looking like we were selling candles. I mean, I would beg people to go to Whole Foods and just buy a candle. Please just go buy a candle. Please, please, please. Now, you know, we're in so many Whole Foods stores and now they do the bug spray, which is, you know, they are, they're not me, but the FDA has deemed it the most effective natural bug spray um, manufactured in the U.S. um, with geranium. That's amazing. That is amazing. So now I don't have to go buy products. I can just relax. But back in the day, I was like, you know, it's so tenuous when you're starting a business. It's pretty... Like, you know, 10 candles a week coming off the shelf at Whole Foods would make or break us. Wow. That is. Are there other moments you remember like that? Kind of the scrappy years, if you will, where you're you're going to buy candles or you're you're the you know, you're setting up chairs. I mean, for me, it's like I remember doing meetups before events would start and I would give out free books and I'd be on stage and everybody like kind of off to the side outside because I wasn't invited to speak at the event and everybody would be in line to get a better seat at the event and nobody's over at your little stand and you're like, hey, guys, got free books. And people are like, uh, free, too expensive. And you're like, OK, <laughs> do you remember other stories like that where it was like the scrappy years? Listen, I still love the scrappy stuff. I still like thrive on the scrappy stuff. So. I would say the biggest new, the latest scrappiest thing for me was going over to Poland at the end of August to work with a brand new group. I'm working with knitters from Ukraine who are all in exile. And, you know, there's a huge link between, you know, women refugees and human trafficking and 
there are just reports all the time about the increased gender-based violence going on for women from Ukraine right now. It's awful. So all the women fled eastern Ukraine, came to central Ukraine. We met up with them in Poland to start this new knitting business that's going great. But, I mean, we were trying to find a place to meet to knit in Stargard, Poland, and there was um, this small community center, and they said we could have this small room. And we were trying to get supplies in. We were trying to knit, and we were pulling tables together. And finally, you know, I don't know, we paid somebody a couple hundred bucks. They let us be in there and we could bring lunch in there and we could start this project. But it was so intimate and so scrappy. And it's like, this is my favorite thing is to begin the dream with people. Yeah. Just to sit and say, here's yeah. the hope. And, you know, the women from Ukraine were like, we want to believe in the dignity of work. And this is so important to us. We don't want to just be waiting and waiting. We want to do stuff that they've lost homes, they've lost jobs, they've lost everything. And then they were also talking about their surviving on hope. And if they can knit and share these products in the U.S., they know people will be thinking about them and, you know, helping them gain strength through this horrible invasion that they're experiencing. So I love the scrappy stuff. Sometimes I get, um, you know, if it's just meetings or you know, you're just coming in to speak and you walk out and you're not involved in the scrappy part. Sometimes that's Mm -hmm. what makes me feel kind of disconnected. Does that make sense? Totally. And you have to go, wait a second, let me plug back into the scrappy part. Where's the, like, where's the on the, on the ground, you know, hands, hands are working kind of part. Yeah. That, that makes a, that makes a ton of sense. I would open for you for any event and set up chairs for you. Happy to do that. <laughs> that's, you know, that's not, that's so funny. Like I'd ever be like, Becca, let's get these chairs going. Come on. That's so funny. We've done, I mean, we've like, we did an event at the cafe. Uh, we held a small event at the cafe. So I feel like I really opened for you more than anything. Yes. Um, and I've seen you at the Ryman. And if I remember correctly, you weren't even wearing shoes. Do I remember that correctly? Yes, you were barefoot at the Ryman. The cool way I, to speak. That's the cool way to speak is shoeless. Everybody. I knew, I knew it. It's that's how you send out the vibe that you're like, I'm easy going. Like what? Look, I'm barefoot up here. Like I'm chill. Nobody Nobody would believe that about me for a second. I'm wound so tight. There's like, if I took my shoes off, they'd be like, what's this guy? What's this guy's? I'd be in a suit. First of all, it's a terrible look. That's so funny. Well, Becca, I love the work you're doing. Um, two last questions. One, we ask everybody. Um, last second, to last question. If you had to say, here's your Mount Everest of books you love to read or you recommend to read, what's on your Mount Everest of books? Or the other way to answer the question, ask the question, because sometimes people are like, ah, four books at once, like, is what's a book you've given away more than any other than your own? So like, obviously, like we both give it, you write books, I write books, we give those away because we're super generous. A lot of people say that. Um, What's a book you've given away more than any other or what's on your Mount Rushmore books? Okay, when you mean Mount Rushmore books, do you mean my favorite book? Yeah, your favorite four books. There's four people on Mount oh, Rushmore, like so, oh. and they can be all over. They can be fiction. They can be nonfiction. You said Mount Everest at first. Oh, Mount Everest. What's the What's the tallest book you've read? That's what like I meant. from the spine. What's the biggest spine? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> What kind of terrible question would that be? What's the I can't even understand the question. All right. What? Okay, my favorite four books, the ones that had a big impact on me. I remember um, Dorothy Day's book, The Long Loneliness, huge impact on me. Howard mm-hmm. Thurman, Meditations of the Heart. Um, I remember, oh, gosh, uh, what's it called? The Understory, the one I read... It was about trees. It's a great book. The Understory is a great, great book. And I did like um, the one on Frederick Douglass. I did love his autobiography, but also the one that just came out recently. My husband did a show on it, um, but it's American Prophet. It's so good. All of those are great books. The one book that I've given away, the one that I've given away the most, don't know that one. I Mm -hmm. don't know. Maybe um, all the books that I've written blurbs for that then you get a free copy of, I give those away. Yeah. So I sometimes give those to the UPS store. 
Like they have a lot of books because there's a lady there at my P.O. box that loves to read. So sometimes we're like, oh, hey, and she's pretty excited. So like I like to think she's read a lot of books. And based on me going like, hey, I got a new book. Would you like to? I think about that constantly. The reason I give them away, though, is that you've already read the book digitally to do the blurb. And then you get a copy. That's why you give them away. Not oh, yeah. the books. I've already read. Oh, it. I know the book. Yeah, I've read the book. Yeah, I've, got, I've already read it. Yeah. OK, so what was his last question? Uh, where can people find out more about you and Thistle Farms? Oh, people can find out thistlefarms.org, beccastevens.org. Follow me. I'm mostly on Instagram, um, which I know is a dying art these days, but I still love that medium. And what's your, uh, what are you on Instagram? Are you just Becca Stevens? Yeah, Becca Stevens. Becca Stevens. And then our candle thing that we're doing together is 500lightshome.com. You can go get a candle right now. Um People will buy them as gifts. They're beautiful. They're super fancy. Give us like the four stats on the candles. Give us the like, like there's no paraffin or is that right? I don't know. I don't know the stats. I know they're amazing. You know them better than I do. You make 54000 a year. Oh, I would say the four stats on the candle are cotton wicks, soy wax, 100% essential oils, and 36 hours of burning time. Boom. Boom. Nice. I was just saying pretty words like they're pretty. <laughs> they smell like Christmas trees. Some of them um, like, yeah, you did a way better job with that. It's like you're a pro at this. Becca, thank you so much for joining me. I love what you do. I love getting to hang out with you in Nashville, and I can't wait to see where this episode goes to help women around the world. You are the best, and I appreciate your love and your kindness and can't wait to see you at the farm. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with Becca Stevens today. We'll put all the links in the show notes as always. And thank you for reviewing my podcast. I love the reviews you guys write. Please keep those coming. Please follow, subscribe, whatever it is the kids are saying these days. And please write a review. I'll be back next week. And remember, all it takes is a goal. And don't forget to pick up your copy of The Finish Calendar. Brand new, massive, beautiful, double-sided, vertically or horizontally, paper or dry erase at finishcalendar.com. Once again, that's finishcalendar.com. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the All It Takes is a Goal podcast and to get access to today's show notes and exclusive content from John Acuff, visit acuff.me slash podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast.